starting this all over again. I had a whole bunch of extraneous material on the tape before. Marmy was sure you wanted me to reminisce about 21 years of naval service. And I'm convinced from letters that you only wanted Astoria reminiscences. Uh, besides, probably just as well to start over, maybe get my thoughts a little bit better connected than what they were. The, uh, I'm a little bored. The Astoria, the last of 1938, last part. I came aboard because I had a cousin that I had become friendly with during the Fleet Week operation in Portland. His name was Harold Colton. He started out getting a nickname of Horse Colt because of the Colton. And somebody said, hey, he's too stubborn to be just a horse colt. He's a mule colt. And from that time on, as far as the Astoria was concerned, his name was Mule. He still remains Mule to me, but uh, he pretty well lived it down. Other than that, I don't think too many people call him that anymore. He, uh, I went aboard Astoria because Bill was aboard it, and we made one liberty together, and he took off because he was getting paid off. He was on the kitty cruise, and they transferred him away early because we were getting ready to go to the, uh, to the Caribbean maneuvers. But uh, that one liberty was a doozy, though. He came back from Liberty and spent three days in sick bay. And they said I was fighting. I, from the, my condition, I would say that the other guy was fighting, but I wasn't. Well, for, due to my own misconduct, I had to make it up. Because I wasn't supposed to do that. I was introduced to the Navy life aboard ship rather suddenly. Who aboard uh, Mud? I can't think of his first name, but Bosun Mate Mud was the first division Bosun Mate, and that's the first dude I worked for aboard ship. Didn't stay long in the first division, though. It was just kind of a tentative thing, and they sent me over to the second where I worked with Pancho Valdez. Uh, Pancho was more of a traditional boatswain's mate. Uh, 5'16 shoe and size 3 hat. Mud was pretty uh, much of an intellectual, very intelligent, small. reasonably well educated, and, and so on. Pancho, though, had his, had his good points. We had our problems, like every seaman had with Pancho. Sometimes he didn't really understand my particular sense of humor. But we got along pretty well, considering everything. I said, it wasn't, uh, we took off. Caribbean very shortly after I went aboard the early part of 1949. And we operated in connection with Ford, many hopeless. So not an awful lot doing. We were at sea just about all the time we were there. I wouldn't get ashore one time in the Caribbean. We, uh, Numbers came out at different ports and passed bottles of rum through the portholes so that uh, those of us that didn't get ashore still uh, got a little taste of the 
explosive alcoholic product. We were all drinking from the same bottle. Maneuver situation in the Caribbean. And uh, I was at the barber shop waiting in line to get my hair cut. Not much of anything else to do at the time. And we got to talking about different scuttlebutt, and somebody said, hey, let's, let's start some new scuttlebutt. Kind of a strange thing. Uh, we, uh, people come up with different kinds of scuttlebutt that we ought to start. And uh, then somebody says, "Hey, how about this?" It, uh, I think this is a newcomer to the to the lineup. He says, "You know that Jap that died in Washington D.C. not long ago? We're going to take him back to Japan." Let's take his body back. And uh, I've thought about it since, and I've decided that that guy must have had a little bit of inside information because it wasn't but a very few minutes afterwards, maybe 15, 20 minutes when they passed the word that we were going to, we were getting underway and heading for the States, and we were going to take the ashes for Hiroshi Saito back to Japan. We were off on a diplomatic mission. I guess uh, my first liberty after my debacle of, uh, in L.A. when I first went aboard ship, I think that was New Year's Day that, that happened to me, was in Norfolk. I had been hitting the gee dunk stand pretty, pretty heavy, and I was ashore in Norfolk, Virginia, and lost all my excess poundage on 172. C.C. Gill, the former skipper, did send down a truckload of beer, so we'd all had got a, a bottle of a drink at least. Turner didn't particularly like that, but there wasn't an awful lot he could do about it. I guess uh, Gill ranked him a little bit. Went on on to Japan. It was uh, the main thing I remember about the trip to Japan, other than the fact that I was a little bit seasick, uh, was that uh, I was on uh, lookout watch. And at the time, we were supposed to be looking for any evidence of uh, wreckage or a derelict anything. It was about the time that uh, Richard Halliburton had took off from China to sail across the Pacific in a, in a junk. Uh, now, maybe bright woodwork is not a thing to worry about on a junk. I don't know. But I did see a piece of bright woodwork, varnished and all, uh, come floating past uh, the ship on the starboard side, and I was lookout. I reported it to the officer of the deck who completely ignored it. I don't remember who the OD was, but I remember I was pretty put out by the fact that they didn't pay any attention to the fact that I had seen that bright woodwork. Uh, I was uh, along those lines. It might have been the same officer of the deck who later on when I was reporting the, the uh, 
running lights in the running light was was out. And I reported it as a running light not lit. We, it was quite often that the lookouts would just go ahead and report bright light because they didn't bother to look to see if the light was bright or not. And in this case, I think the, the talker heard bright light. And I caught hell for misreporting and not really checking. And I had checked, and somebody else was was at fault. But be that as it may, I had the trip to Japan was relatively uneventful. Um, some of the stuff swept and swayed with old arcade, but was pretty busy. We had a photographer and a lot of pretty fancy camera equipment aboard at that time, especially for the trip. And this photographer was locked in to a room from the outside with his cameras. And as we went into Japan, he was taking pictures, uh, of course, to, for military purposes, checking for defenses and offenses and whatever. Uh, and uh, I guess he got a lot of pictures. But I was told later that the pictures that had been taken by one of our tourist or type swabbies from the main deck turned out to be a lot better pictures than what the professional had taken. And his pictures were taken and uh, used by naval intelligence to of superior to what the profession had taken. We were welcomed in Japan. It was, uh, we were, uh, the people welcomed us with open arms. The, uh, mayor of uh, Yokohama had, uh, planned a big party for us, with a woman for every man aboard ship, of which uh, Admiral, uh, not Admiral, I guess it was Captain Drew, who was the ambassador at that time, put a kibosh to. But we did have a big party that was run by the mayor of Yokohama. World tour of uh, Tokyo went with, to with visit the Imperial Gardens, and uh, the people very, 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 very friendly. Uh, the school children all wanted to practice both English on the American sailors, Marines, whatever. Uh, and so everybody was very nice. Uh, everybody had a good time. There was nobody got into any trouble except our beloved chaplain who was uh, got drunk and tore up the whorehouse. Uh, he uh, told the police he was trying to con convert those sinners to Christianity and save their souls. I can't remember their, I don't know if it was their souls that he was especially interested in or not. But he was the only, only one in the crew that, that did get into trouble in Japan. We had a, a parade. The Marines paraded. Uh, there were several swabbies in Marine uniforms because some of the Marines weren't tall enough to suit them. They wanted the both parading to be around six feet tall so that they would look down on the Japanese counterparts. And because of that, the taller Oscar Swabies were dressed up as Marines and paraded with them. We actually had to draft people to go to the Yokohama Mayor's Tea Party because most of the 
people really believed that what they were going to go was sort of tea. And what they saw was beer, whiskey, sake, or whatever. And while they didn't have a woman for every man at the party, they had an awful lot of entertainers, and it came awfully close to coming out that way. They had the regular entertainers, and they had geisha, and they had different booths, and they had to have put on plays and dances and just about everything imaginable, and all of it lubricated with booze of every description. A good time was had by all. The uh, interesting thing about the well, that the official rate of exchange in Japan at that time was three yen, sixty sen, for one American dollar. The black market rate was four to one. This was made possible by the fact that the Japanese occupation currency in China uh, couldn't be controlled. And it was exactly the same as the regular currency. You couldn't, no difference. So when people bought the yen in China for maybe as high and then smuggled it into Japan, and uh, they could sell it for maybe six to one, and the, the other black market operators sell it for four to one, and everybody made a lot of money except the work Japanese government, and everybody was happy. Uh, one of the foremost places of exchange was the White Horse Bar, which was run by a new tower. Maybe cheap. Who well, later turned out was uh, O and I, and we got him out of there before the war started. But uh, he, from my understanding, he spoke and understood Japanese quite well, and the uh, Japanese patronized his bar quite a bit. The military did. Uh, he overheard an awful lot, but uh, he wasn't intended to overhear. One of the nips who came along to escort Saito's ashes had written up a little English Japanese dictionary for us to, uh, to use to converse with the locals. And uh, one of the uh, one of Benjo's restroom, and I remember going into this gym now, and I had to go, I'd been drinking beer, so I decided I'd try out my Japanese, and the, the real hearty Benjo, I was in my best cup, and uh, although I don't think I said it quite that well at the time, but the guy uh, indicated where the restroom was. Well, I went to the restroom, and but in there, there was a woman in there, you know, squatting over what we call the slot shot. I went, oh my God, I'm in the wrong one. So I go back and ask the bartender again, and he indicated that was the right place. So I went in there again, the woman was still in there, and I noticed that there was also a urine in the place. So I thought, well, maybe she was in the wrong place. Uh, I didn't uh, find out until later that the restrooms were all unisex at that time, and uh, nobody thought anything of it that uh, men and women were using the same restroom at the same time. But uh, another little language thing, I was talking with a Japanese girl who, who spoke pretty good English, bar, bar fly sitting in the booth drinking, and uh, she was talking about Japanese words and American words, and she uh, fingered my undershirt, and she asked, asked me what that was, and I said that was a skivvy shirt, and so she thought that was very, very uh, 
Pazite, skivi, skivi. Oh, skivi ima jedan dobro meaning. Oh, well, years later, when I found out that uh, how come our skivvies got the, the name of skivvy shirt and skivvy pants. When uh, Japan was first opened up, the sailors found that they could Japanese women, uh, we would like that military underwear. And they would trade their under undervant or their undershirts for a piece of tail. And that uh, was skinny. And as a result, the, the Japanese uh, started selling the underwear skeevy pants and skeevy shirts. Uh, they, they came by the name honestly, and uh, it wasn't so nearly as humorous as what I thought it was. She didn't know the whole story either. In any event, as they say, after a pleasant stay, tired but happy, we were on our way to China. We went up to Shanghai, and uh, we anchored out, we got to Shanghai, and another little interesting event that occurred at that time, we had uh, I, we had watches, when I happened to have the power watch, I was second division, and uh, they issued me a BAR. Now, I didn't know too much about a BAR. They gave me that little hip socket, uh, put the butt of the BAR in, and they showed me how to, where the trigger was, and how to put the safety on and take the safety off. Uh, they didn't explain about semi automatic and full automatic. And uh, put me up there and told me to keep the bum boats away. And the bum boats were uh, pretty well all over the place. And they, they didn't really like to pay any attention to me when I told them to get the hell out of there. I had to wave them off and yell and scream. And it didn't do any good. So the uh, Marine captain had the watch. And um, was off through the deck at that time. And uh, I went back to the quarterdeck to report to him that uh, those bum boats wouldn't pay any attention to me. And uh, he was uh, pretty put out with me for leaving my post. And he wrote ways a little hell with me for leaving my post. He said, Well, how am I going to report? If anybody comes around, I, I was also told to report to you. Wrong. He said, Well, <laughs> if you have a lot of trouble with those bum boats, fire a shot across the bow. So that will get their attention, and I'm sure that they will leave you alone. Well, that sounded logical to me, and he also said, Don't worry about reporting anything. You fire one shot, and you have everybody on this ship up here on the bow and nothing up here in the forecastle, nothing flat, and that will include the captain. That sounded like a good idea to me. So the next time one of those bum boats didn't pay any attention to me, I fired a shot across his bow. Problem was that I froze on that trigger and that BAR was in full automatic and I sprayed the whole river with bullets from that BAR. It just swung me around. I had that thing on my hip, and it just turned me right around. I don't know how many rounds I fired before I could let go of that trigger. But you know, that captain was right. I had the skipper and everybody else up on that folks and nothing flat. Skipper in his pajamas and bathroom. Just raising all kinds of hell. 
Well, I was quaking in my boots, and uh, the Marine, God bless him, said, Captain, don't blame the kid. That's my fault. He was doing what I told him to do. And uh, Turner said, I probably called him, said something like, I will see you in my cab as soon as you get off watch. And uh, with me, he ignored me from then on. Uh, but as I recall, they took away the BARs, and uh, the watch standards got a little instruction before they went up for a watch on uh, just exactly what to do in case they had trouble with the bum boats. I never stood that watch again. Uh, they knew better, I guess. I'm sure you've heard a lot of the Shanghai stories. I know as far as I'm concerned, uh, I loved it. I liked it so well that I put in radiatic duty after it. Uh, luckily for me, I didn't get it. And Liberty was cheap. Liberty was wild. The shore patrol was there more to protect you than they were to show you in the break. Uh, and, uh, I got the little amount of money that the Swabby got, but an awful long ways in Shanghai. We, uh, here again, everybody had a pretty good time in Shanghai. We took off again. Uh, Hong Kong, that's again a little bit different. Had to, Still Chinese, still pretty reasonable, uh, but uh, not quite the same as Shanghai. Uh, but still a lot of fun. I had a real good time. Uh, about time with Wan Chai district was pretty much off off limits, uh, but Swabi did still make it down. To the Lan Chai district. It was pretty, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the pirates and smugglers and so on that hung out in Lan Chai district that it could be pretty dangerous for uh, the Swabi itself to be messing around in. But we still to get down. Get away with it mostly. I know I did. I probably got picked up by the patrol. Oh, I got acquainted with a got acquainted with a limey while I was there, and uh, went out to visit a ship, a British battleship, and I don't remember which one. But I'm going to take a take a look around, see how the other. Limey counterparts lived. And uh, I had a chat with him. I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't all that great. And uh, he, I was getting pretty anxious. I wanted to go, go ashore. And he says, Well, what's the, what's the use of going ashore? Because if you go over too soon, well, you're going to spend your money too soon. And uh, he says, I got. Been sold, he'd been sold his grog, and uh, he didn't say, well, he's a buddy of, buddy of rum, he's got lots to drink, and I said, well, you know, uh, booze isn't, isn't everything, there's other things that you do ashore sure, that you can't do aboard ship. He said, oh, that, and he said, I say, and he called over one of his Another one of those swappies. He says, uh, hey, take the yank friend over there in the casemates and fix him up. I <laughs> was pretty much appalled by that. I had like that a funny look on my face. And he says, it's all right. He's mine. <laughs> I went ashore alone. Anyway, he stayed in the ship, and I went on ashore and had my, had my plane. Oh. Uh,
I did one of the dumber things in my life. I worked a long time. Uh, we patronized the local money changers. Nobody went to the bank. They went to the money changer out on the street. They changed to the American currency, the Hong Kong dollars, and vice versa. And we were getting ready to leave. And I was swapping my Hong Kong dollars back to American dollars. In the course of the exchange, uh, they gave me a silver trade dollar. I looked at that, and it looked up just like a regular American dollar, except that it said trade dollar on it. Uh, well, I wasn't going to put up with that kind of stuff. I, I thought going to accept a trade dollar instead of a regular dollar. So I made them give me a dollar bill for it. Uh, I think even at that time, the trade dollar was worth something like 500. Within a very short time, it was worth 1,000. God knows how much it's worth right now. Uh, of course, I wouldn't still have it right now, even if I'd known at that time. I'd have been traded it or sold it for something long before now. Uh, but I had in my hands a real honest to God silver trade dollar. And made him take it back and give me paper money. From Shanghai to Manila, which it probably been plenty said about Manila too, and all the stuff about how Jackson causing the problems that he did in Manila, holding up the ship and so on, which was his eventual downfall. The Philippines was never one of favorite places, although I did have fun in the Philippines, too. I think that I used to have fun and get drunk just about any place we went. But there's not much to be said about Manila. I visited the longest bar in the world, the Santa Ana Cabaret. I went to one dance hall with some. Uh, out in the boondocks. I remember it was not very well patronized by Swahili. It was mostly the Filipinos that went there. And they both had their check room. They made them check their 